So continuing our project, this is what we've got so far. We've got some text, we've got some graphics, but it looks, uh, it almost looks like a, a, a web page or a web project. We've got an HTML project, and so far we've got the ML, the markup language, but we don't have the HT, which is hypertext, which is just a fancy word for documents linked together. So when Tim Berners-Lee was inventing this um, from the documentary that I've heard and history that I've read, he was trying to put together a, a language where he would link documents together, where there was an article and then a word was highlighted and you click that to read further upon that word. Hey, that sounds a lot like Wikipedia, or that sounds a lot like everything that we've seen nowadays, doesn't it? So the HT part, the hypertext part, is what we need now, a link. So let's say we're going to make a link, my name. My name is going to be a link to go to my website. So here, we've written so far on line 15, my name. And I want that to be a, an active link over to my website. So we need the tag to make a link. And it would make great sense that the tag to make a link would be the link tag, but no. The tag to make a link is the A tag. I don't even see the letter A in the word link, do you? But when this was being invented, it's the A tag. It's an anchor, which is a very, of course, fancy way to say, well, this is going to connect to something else. This is an anchor. This text is an anchor to another document. So the A tag for my name right here, A slash A. This is going to need a parameter, just like we had one for image. We said we're going to have an image. Which image? That image. Here I'm saying we're going to have a link. Which link? So notice inside the A tag. Notice the purple. You have to be inside of the A tag. We will write href, hypertext reference, equals, quote, end quote. So now that's a more complete link tag. A slash A, so that will be an active link. Where is it going to go to? href. So within the quotes, we can write a website, http colon slash slash vmcink.net. So save and run that. That should make our, that should make my name a link now. It should behave like you've seen links before. It's going to be underlined. When you put your mouse on it, it becomes a hand. When you click on it, it goes to my website. So see that? There's my name. Now it's underlined. And I click on it. It went to my website. So that completes the concept HTML, hypertext markup language. I've marked my name with the A tag, specifically a hypertext link. Is this a set of icons that you found somewhere? On my site? Yeah. Uh, these right here? Yeah. Yes, these I believe are the, the GNOME icons. They're a set of open source icons that anyone can use, so I borrowed them and I use them on my site. So there's our project, 17 lines. If you haven't had experience in HTML, we're starting to develop some, um, some, um, I just had the word, some uh, consistent aspects of it, some, um, some conventions, which is, uh, notice that all of our tag, most of our tags have a pair, except the ones that don't. 
all the tags we've written, all the code we've written is lowercase. The regular human readable content, well that can have capital letters and all of that, and usually that's between the tags. And the web browser doesn't care if we put it all on one line or multiple lines. But it's good for us as the, as the human, as the editor, to have lines divided or tabs and, and so forth. So this is my project so far. And this um, basically has been in effect since 1989, 1990, around that time, you know, 25 years ago the invention of the World Wide Web. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, as I've said, he built this language based on other languages, published it, and it really spread throughout the world. And the amazing thing is that, uh, that he didn't copyright this, he didn't patent it, it, he didn't trademark it, he didn't lock it down. He gave it free to the world to use. And look at how it has literally changed the world. We do our online banking, we, we do shopping, we meet friends and family. Countries are changed, literally. Remember the Arab Spring? People were on the internet, a medium that didn't exist before, to, to protest their government, to change their, their country um, out of this new medium, the World Wide Web, which is 25 years old. The internet is older, but technically the internet is, is different. The internet is a variety of networks connected, whereas the World Wide Web websites are only 25 years old. The internet itself is more around from an, about 1969. So other older networks have been out there. Usenet, um, Gopher, Archie, all of that old stuff. And nowadays, the big thing is, well, we use the web so much, that's a part of the internet, and we have access. Anyone can write this code and create a website. And then eventually, we're going to take our knowledge of HTML and make an Android app out of it. That's how much it has evolved. And it's accessible to us all for free. The editor here is free. The code is free. Um, the software tools, the frameworks, the icons, all of that stuff can be free. Um, creating, an apps, uh, creating an account to, to publish it on Amazon is free. We can publish free apps, etc. So there's a lot of ability for us. There's a very low barriers to entry to publishing an Android app. Well, we're still a ways from that point. This is not an app yet. First of all, it looks very boring. I would like some color, maybe some, uh, some text colors or background colors or something. It's a little boring. That's when the other piece of the puzzle comes in, CSS. Everything that we've written here is HTML. And HTML basically is the structure of our app or our website, our structure here. We've got a heading, we've got a paragraph, we've got a link. It's the basic foundation. But just like this building here has a foundation and it has walls and so forth, well, there's paint a certain color of white on the wall and the floor has a certain kind of tile and it has a design and, you know, everything that is designed, the look of this room, in a sense, I would think about it as the second pillar of our project, which is CSS. Stands for Cascading Style Sheets. But basically, it's how to make our app look nice. Whereas HTML is the structure of our app, CSS is for the design of our app, the look and feel of it. And that was invented at about 1998. So let's play with some CSS. I don't want this plain white background. I don't want this plain black text. I want different colors. CSS is powerful. Powerful in that it can change colors and so forth, but powerful enough that it can let us place things anywhere we want on the screen and even animate things. So that's the second pillar of our project, CSS. And there's three big ways to write CSS. We'll write the most basic way first, and then more advanced ways. What I want to do is change the background color of our project. All of our headings and paragraphs and images are encapsulated by the body tag. Notice everything that's visible in the web browser 
is inside the body tag. And the default style is then white background, black text. I want to change that. I want to have a different background color and a different text color. So we'll go to the body tag, line 9, in the body tag, space, notice I'm in the tag, don't write it after the tag, in the tag, and we'll write style equals quote, end quote. What we're about to write is what's known as inline CSS. Quick and dirty, we're able to change this part of the document. And for a 17-line <coughs> web page, that's fine. This, however, is not the best practice. There are other ways to write CSS more efficiently. Uh, embedded up in the uh, head section or even better in an external file. But we'll get to that later. We'll just play a little bit with some CSS here. Inside of the style property, we will write background dash color. Notice there's a dash there. Dash color. Colon, which is shift semicolon next to the L. Space. Then we can we have a, a, a few hundred colors to choose from, but we'll try pink. <coughs> Just because you can type it with one hand if you know how to touch type. Did you ever think about that? Oh yes, and then a semicolon at the end. We're sort of terminating the statement there, like a period, in a sense, of a sentence in English. So we're saying we're changing the style of the body, specifically the background color, color specifically pink. So try that. Save it and run it. There we go, we get a nice shade of Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> well, maybe pink isn't your thing? Well, try blue. <coughs> get a very harsh blue. Okay, what about red? What about green? What about yellow? What about fuchsia? Purple. Try a color. See if you can find uh, an interesting color. See if you can find a color that doesn't work. Blue doesn't work. Blue technically doesn't work because it hurts my eyes, but it does work. Um, peach doesn't work because it goes back to white. So if a color doesn't work, it goes back to the default. But maybe a close relative to peach is bisque. Um, now is that lobster bisque or I don't know which kind of bisque, but uh, we have a variety of colors to choose from like purple and fuchsia and azure. Has anyone heard of the color azure? It's a very light blue. And then another shade is Alice Blue. Well, how would you even know this? Let me take a segue here. I'm going to show you. I've been showing you some HTML code, some very basic ones. There's dozens and dozens more to learn. I'm going to show you a nice reference of list of all of them. And I'm going to show you a reference of possible CSS attributes. Because right here we're changing the background color. What else can we change? We'll see that in a moment. And I'm choosing random colors. You would have never thought to choose Alice Blue. You would have never thought to choose Corn Husk. Or maybe I spelled it wrong. but. Um, I think we've also got brick. I don't have them all memorized, but red brick. But I'll show you a list of that, too. Purple. Um, I'll show you a list of all of these things. 
because even though this is going to be a three-month course, we don't have time to cover every single aspect of everything. Let's say, though, I've written background color, purple, and when, when people start to learn about that we have a world of color that we can work with in HTML, then of course sometimes we start off with, well, let's add a really cool color, black. And there we go, we had a black background. But black text on a black background, can't see it. So we can also edit our text color. We've edited background color after the semicolon but before the quote, I'll add a space, and I can add here another property. I want to change my text color. So if it was background-color, then it would make sense text-color, right? Well, it would make too much sense, because when they were inventing this, they didn't make it text color. They made it simply color. So background dash color to edit the background color, semicolon space color to edit the text color. That's just the way it is, which you'll have to memorize. Color edits text color. Colon, space, and then the color, and then semicolon. So some background could be white, but it colon? Technically, no. You could have it just like that. Any way that you do it is fine. But oftentimes, whatever you learn first sticks with you, and it's not the wrong way, really. But the way I'm doing it is, just for readability also, I put a space after a colon. If you learned in another class not to put a space there, that'll work still. It is. That will require more CSS to change the default behavior because the default behavior is blue or purple and if we want it to be yellow or pink or anything else we have to change it and that's the whole uh, point of CSS to edit the defaults of HTML to our purposes and as time goes on we'll be talking about writing more CSS to fully customize things. So now if I run it again. There we go. Now I can read the text. White text, black background. Or I can write uh, brown background, pink text. The link didn't behave though. The link is different. It's not regular text or it's not a, a heading. It's, it's a link. So, as I was saying, we'll have to write code, or CSS, um, to, uh, to edit that, but we'll get to that later. Now, the... Let me do this blue here. No, I'll do it like this. We'll do Alice blue here, and then we'll do Azure here. This is an example of a very low contrast screen. Very hard to read. It's two different, two completely different colors, technically, but very hard to read. Um, so we have to think about contrasts. If you think about most of the, the documents that you read, oftentimes they're very easy to read. Like if you look on the walls, all of the posters and stuff that we have there, we can read them very easily because, because oftentimes we have high contrast. We have black text on a white background. We have a foreground on a background. The foreground is the text and the background is the paper. So a foreground black, a background white, very readable. That's why most flyers and documents and books are black <coughs> on white. Here I've got then a foreground that's very light and a background that's very light, no contrast. 
we should have one that's light and one that's dark. A foreground that's dark and a background that's light. Or a foreground that's light and a background that's dark. That's why the default of black on white is very readable. Actually, the very, very first version of HTML was black on gray. <coughs> that wasn't very readable. So then eventually the standard was black on white. And here, I've chosen amazing colors, but they don't work together very well. Because my background is light, then my foreground is light. So if I choose instead color foreground black, contrast, readability. I could do not black, maybe brown. Still readable, and it's not like the boring black and white. So here I'm just getting at, and we'll need to think about it as time goes on, contrasts. That's an aspect of user interface design. That's something we need to talk about too. Not just being able to write our code, we might be a pro at that, but if our icons are too close together, or if our contrast is bad, then we don't have good user experience. We don't have a good user interface design. And that's something we should think about as well. And we'll talk about it as we get to those topics. But anyway, choose a couple of, of colors that you like, foreground and background. And we're applying this basically to the whole project, body. We've changed the style of body. But we can also target individual parts of the project. We can do this. We can go to style, that is, we can style heading one independently of the background. So I've gone in here to my heading 1, and I've added style inside the tag. I've changed this background color to white, semicolon, and then color black, semicolon. So now, only on heading 1 do I have a different style. See how that looks like. Well, I don't have a lot of contrast. You can kind of see it there. <coughs> but if I was more obvious, So I kind of can do a little effect here that almost looks like a cookie cutter that I've cut into the color. And that's just by having a text color the same or similar to the background color of the body. Now, with CSS, what we're writing here is CSS, and like I said, it's inline CSS. Um, this is the second pillar of our project. Eventually, we'll get to the third pillar, which is JavaScript. HTML is the structure of our project, CSS is the design of our project, and then JavaScript is the interactivity of our project. <coughs> JavaScript is what will allow us to do something when we click a button, when we click a, a button to calculate a tip, when we click a button to send an email, when we swipe to do something, when we activate a timer and the timer runs out and you display the high score, when we save data to a database, when we connect to a server, 
That's the interactivity, and that's JavaScript. We'll get to that eventually. JavaScript is what will allow us to write one line of code to turn on the camera and take a photo. And then via um, HTML and CSS, then display the picture on screen. So those three are our pillars of our app. First it's going to be a web app, and then eventually it'll be an Android app, but it's going to rely on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This is the app so far. We still have more to do, of course, but let's take a quick pause here. If you've got something interesting like this, not no longer black and white, great. Anyone need a little bit of help? Are you missing something here or there? Anyone need any help? Looks like we're all on track pretty well. That's good. Now, in the class, uh, as I said, these lectures, I'm recording them. I'm going to put them up online. You want to send me an email, and I'll send you to the link to the videos, so you can replay them over and over. I'm also going to put a copy of my work in the network folder. That one I'm not going to put online. It's going to be in the network folder in this room. So at the end of the day, I'll put my work in there if you want a copy of my work. When we start the next day, next time of work, you can get a copy of my work to continue where I left off if you want. So it's going to be in the Z drive, exactly. So I'll remind us at the end of the day. But yes, I'm going to give my work to you if you want it. Um, the CSS that we've learned so far has just been, uh, you know, a few parlor parlor tricks of color. But CSS is more powerful than that because it can al also allow us to place things on the screen in various positions. It allows us to do special effects like rounded corners and drop shadows and animation. So let's play with that a little bit. Let's say, notice I've got all my text leaning to the left side, which is what the default of HTML is, everything on the left. I want to put everything in the center of my screen. There's many ways to do this. One of the fastest ways to do this is I'm going to go back to the body tag and I'm going to add one more property to the style. So after the color of text, semicolon, I will write uh, text dash align colon space center semicolon. text dash align colon center semicolon. Save and run that. I'm writing that on line 9, still within the body tag. We can have as many uh, CSS uh, declarations here as we want. What happens, what should happen is my hello world text is centered and my HTML, my paragraph of HTML is centered, my heading 2 is centered, my name is centered, even the picture is centered. It's not text, but it still works for, for a picture. So just like any programming or markup language and such, there's many ways to do the same thing. If you've had some experience before, you probably know other ways to do it. And we will talk about some of those other ways. But right now we're just exploring, especially for beginners, some aspects of what CSS can do. Uh, more of what CSS can do is, um, well, we can define the sizes of things as well. For example, that graphic. That graphic came in at a certain size. And it's a particular size because I put it on my website and I need it at that size. But let's say you have a picture that's very large. And when you, when you add your picture to your project, it's too large. I want to shrink it down to fit within the, the confines of my design. So with CSS, we can control that. With CSS, we can change sizes of elements. So let's change the size of, of my picture here. In the 
image tag, we've got our source of the picture, and it doesn't matter where we add it, but at the end, we've got image and then source. At the end, I will add style. I will add CSS. So go to the end, in the tag, inside of the angle bracket. Be very careful here. Not outside there, that the browser will think you're trying to do something else. In the tag. Style equals quote, end quote. We can say with colon, let's try 100 px semicolon space height colon 200 px semicolon. So we can use CSS not only to define colors, we can use it to define alignment of elements. We can use it to define sizes of elements. <laughs> so here we've got width 100 px. Does anyone know what px stands for? Pixels. Good. Pixels are just the little dots on screen. So here I'm saying make the width of my picture 100 pixels wide, 100 dots wide, and then make its height 200 dots high. How does that look? Well, it did what we told it, but it doesn't look good. It made the width 100 and the height 200. It didn't keep it in proportion. So maybe I wanted 200 wide and two and 200 tall, 200 width and 200 height. There we go. So we made it a little larger, but notice it's starting to lose quality. The original picture was designed that small and it looked nice, but then when I stretch that out to 200 pixels, now it's fuzzy. So it didn't visually didn't quite work that we started with a small graphic and made it a large graphic. It's better to start with a large graphic and make it a small graphic. So when we get to that, we will be working with larger graphics and shrinking them down as necessary to fit within the different sizes of, of screens and still retain good quality. So that'll be for later uh, to work with graphics of higher quality to shrink them down is good, to start with graphics of lower quality and scale them up is bad, in short. Now, a pixel is a unit of measurement, um, what you would call an absolute value, meaning this is exactly 200 pixels wide and tall. And 200 pixels might look fine on our monitor here. On my projector, it looks pretty good. On your monitor, it might look smaller. And then on our mobile device, it might be huge because we've got different size monitors, different size screens. So using hard values or absolute values like this sometimes is not the way to go. Sometimes we want to use relative values. Those are values that will change depending on the size of the monitor, of the screen. So a pixel is an absolute value. It doesn't grow or shrink as necessary to fit onto your device. And right here I've got three devices to test on, and they're slightly different each. So let's do this instead. Let's say with 75%. Notice there's no <coughs> space on percent. And actually, let's completely remove the height. So now we only have width 75%. What does that look like? Seventy-five percent. 
it's much larger than before. I didn't specify any pixel value, but now this is 75%. 75% of what? 75% of the size of my web browser. So if I increase my web browser even larger, it's still 75%, now it's even larger. And as I grow and shrink my screen, it responds to the size of my screen to fill it up appropriately. This is the, the basis of something you might have heard of called responsive web design. Responsive web design is creating a structure of a project that responds to the size of the screen that it's on. And one of the basic tenets of that is using relative units. So percentage, percentages. So obviously on a very large screen like this, that looks terrible. But if I started with a large graphic and put 75%, I start with a larger quality and it's able to shrink and grow to the size necessary. So in my case here, 75% makes it very fuzzy. And notice I only had to set a width, and the height automatically changed. That's a shortcut built into CSS. Sometimes I don't need to define a, a, a height if I've defined a width, because it'll stay in proportion. But just for fun, let's say we take this down to 25%. Now it's going to be 25% of the screen, 25% of the width and height of the screen. And as, uh, even if I make it larger or smaller, it's going to get larger and smaller, the web browser. And the picture is going to get larger and smaller, but it's never going to be as large as before. So that's one of the other aspects that uh, CSS uh, can edit. Dimensions of an object. That's why CSS is one of the pillars of modern web design. It's going to be one of the pillars of our Android app because it allows us to uh, define the look and manipulate the objects on screen of our... Uh, manipulate the properties of our objects on screen. We'll do one more thing and then we'll be just at the end of the day, at the end of the class. <clears throat> um, this that we've written all day long, we've been writing HTML5 compliant code because of our doc type. We haven't really written any HTML5 specific code, though. As the language has evolved, new tags have been invented. In our case today, we haven't written any HTML5 specific tags. We could if we needed them, but we didn't get to it. We've been writing CSS, technically CSS 2.1. Um, that's been evolving as well. And the latest version of CSS is CSS 3. We're going to use CSS 3. One of the CSS 3 properties that we'll use is, in the old days, I had a block of color like this, let's say, and I didn't want a boring right angle, a 90 degree angle on the, on the color. I wanted a nice round corner. In the old days, I would then fire up Photoshop 7.0 and design a rounded corner, four little rounded corner graphics, and put them in a table and put it on screen, and I've got a rounded graphic. Cool. But then the boss says, okay, we need to change our branding. It's no longer a pink background, it's a, uh, it's a red background. So I'd have to go back into Photoshop, edit those four graphics again, upload them again, and I have rounded red corners. And the boss said, okay, actually we needed a, uh, a crimson color. So I have to go back to Photoshop and edit that color again and so forth. Well, CSS3 came along with one CSS property. We can do that. No editing in Photoshop. If the boss changes his mind three times, we just <coughs> change the one little bit of code. Done. So that's CSS3. Let's write some CSS3 to make rounded corners here. Um, on line 10, 
That's our heading number one. Background color, text color. Let's add a new property here after text color. This is brand new cutting edge CSS3. This is border dash radius colon. Let's start off with 25 pixels. Yes, I know I just said about absolute values and so forth, but follow me for a moment. Border dash radius colon 25 px. Also very important, no space between the number and the units. Border radius 25 pixels. What's the result? Rounded corners. Let's change this to 5px. Slightly rounded corners. Ten px. So we can make different. We can make different sized border radiuses here. Radii. And I just change the value of the roundness or the value of the background color, and that's it. I don't have to go back to Photoshop. Um, this is CSS3. On some older web browsers, sometimes CSS3 doesn't work. And you'll just get a, still the plain old uh, 90 degree angle edge. Uh, older browsers like you know Firefox 1.0 and Chrome 3 and Internet Explorer 7 and you know older browsers stuff has evolved. You probably don't know what version of a browser you have, but it, you've probably been updating it, so your browser is going to be able to handle this. And eventually, this is going to be an Android app. Android apps have some of the newest cutting edge uh, features, so being able to use CSS3 and HTML5 will just work. We don't have to worry about vendor prefixes, and if you've got some experience in this stuff, you might be asking, well, why don't we add the Mozilla vendor prefix? Uh, tish tosh. We don't need to do that. We're going to be using the most current versions of the language because we're going to be targeting the most current devices. We're not really making this app for Internet Explorer 6 uh, on Windows XP. We're going to be dealing with an Android app, uh, an Android device, or an iPhone, or a Windows phone with the latest technology. So I am going to be just using the basic CSS3 conventions. Uh, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. We are writing the latest version of the code. That's all you need to know. Border radius, 10 pixels. One more thing and then we'll wrap up. I can add a drop shadow with CSS. Let's say I want a, a drop shadow behind my picture. Well, in the old days, I would open that in Photoshop. I would add a drop shadow uh, layer style. I would put it on the site, and then the boss changes his mind. More drop shadow. So I go back to Photoshop, edit it again, upload it again, add more drop shadow. We can, do, we can accomplish the same thing with CSS. Let's add some drop shadow to my picture. We will go to our style property here. In addition to width, we will add um, box dash shadow colon space semicolon. I'm finishing this before I add the details because box shadow is a little more complica complicated than some of the others we've done before. <coughs> With has um, the property and the value, and so did text align. It's one to one, basically. <coughs> But box shadow is a little more complex because we have to add four extra little parameters here. We have to write x offset, y offset, blur, and color. We have to add four mini properties, four elements to make the box shadow really work. So 
notice if my hand is on the board here, I get a drop shadow. There's a shadow behind my hand. As I get closer to the wall, the, the offset, how far it is from my hand, is a certain value. And if I go off further, notice it's kind of like further down. The offset uh, is different. That's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, how, how much over and down is the drop shadow pushed? We also define how blurry it is. When my hand is close to the screen, the shadow is very sharp. As I go further away, the shadow gets blurrier. We can define that. And this drop shadow of my hand is basically black or, or gray. But if that light were red, I would have a more reddish shadow, right? We can define the color of the shadow as well. That's why we need four properties here. So box shadow. Let's start off with 5px space 5px space 5px space and then black. I'm saying push the shadow 5 pixels over, 5 pixels down, blur it 5 pixels and make it black. Save and run that. There we go. Drop shadow. Well, what happens if I put 25px <coughs> there, 55px here, 1px here, and pink here? See, it might look like it's further rising off the, the page with more X and Y offset. The object looks like it's higher off the page. The third value is blur. What if I keep it at 5px, 5px, 10px blur, and a shadow red. And we'll do green. <coughs> so it's being pushed over to the right and down. <coughs> what if I want the shadow to the left and up? Negative values. So if I had negative 5, negative 5, It's moved to the left and then up. Positive values are to the right and down, and negative values are to the left and up. And what's between negative and positive? Zero. So if we add zero, it looks like the whole thing is glowing. Notice I didn't write pixels, because you don't really write zero pixels. There's, there's nothing there. It's zero. So zero, zero offset, 10 pixel blur, green color, gives me a glow around my picture without Photoshop. Now again, this is not going to work in Internet Explorer 6 and 7 and 8. I don't know. It should work on Internet Explorer 9 and 10 and 11. No problem. It should work on almost any version of Chrome, any version of Firefox, Safari. So it's the old browser that this won't work, but this is not mission critical. It's okay that someone doesn't see a blur here, uh, a glow. It's not going to break the app. It's just icing on the cake. And on our devices, this will work just fine because it's, it's a modern device. It'll adhere to the modern standards. So little by little, Remember, we're going to learn to crawl, then to walk, then to run. Today was talking about the basics of HTML. When we come back on Thursday, we're going to go further. We're going to start learning quicker shortcuts and more code and start to work faster and getting to a point where we're going to create our web app by the end of the month and also look at JavaScript and all that other cool stuff. 
but this is what our, our project is so far. I want to show you a couple of quick websites, then we'll wrap up for lab time, because this is the tip of the iceberg. I want to show you a website where you can learn even more HTML and CSS. Remember I told you, where's that website that tells me all the colors I can choose and all the CSS? This website right here. You can go to w3schools.com. At w3schools.com, they have a variety of lessons, learn HTML, learn CSS, learn JavaScript, learn PHP, learn CGI, etc., etc., etc. There's lots of lessons here. You go through these lessons, and then at the end you get a certificate, and all of this is free. There's a, there's a link somewhere here, HTML reference. This will give you alphabetically every single HTML tag. There's the CSS reference. It'll give you every single possible CSS code. It'll give you a list of all the possible color combinations. Because we haven't, we've talked about writing colors as human readable, but we can write colors by formula, if you know the RGB formula. And so, over at W3 Schools, you get tutorials, you get references, you get examples. Tutorials are not just in HTML and CSS, but in JavaScript, server-side stuff like PHP, web building, tutorials, and so forth. You get examples. This is one of many, uh, one of many websites where you can continue to continue your experiences. Here it's talking about CSS, written in a different way than we did. We were writing inline uh, CSS, and this is a different way. This is a slightly better way, which we will do together when we get back to it next uh, on Thursday. But I wanted to show you this site because it's a really good site for you to learn more HTML and CSS. Um, there's also Code Academy. Academy. CodeAcademy.com, learn to code. So you can start the HTML lessons, Code Academy. You can go to YouTube and find a bunch of tutorials there of people teaching you stuff. There's many, many other sites. These are just a couple off the top of my head. Uh, one more that I'll mention, I just found out about this one, although it might not be the best for everyone, but this is uh, uh, livecoding.tv. What this is, is uh, people... Um, Hello? Uh, they have sort of like their own channel here. Uh, and they and they code, they write their code, and they're doing it live, like a lecture here. You can ask them questions. Uh, there's a schedule here where you can see what are the lessons coming up and watch it live. You can create your own account. If you have experience, you can share your experience. Livecoding.tv So those are three places where you can continue to learn. And when we come back on Thursday, we will we will continue to work. This is what we've got so far, and it's a it's a ways off from our final project, but we have to learn to crawl before we can run, before we can walk, crawl before we can walk, before we can run.